Hi, I'm Mariel. You're watching She Wants the Diction, and today is going to be kind of a combination of recent reads and a queer lit readathon uh, discussion video, I guess you could call it. I have been in a massive reading slump ever since Black Leopard Red Wolf. <laughs> It's taken me like maybe a week to a week and a half to like get back to normal and start reading again. And I have been participating in the Queer Lit Readathon, um, although I started pretty late. I don't think I got my books till like the third and it's now the sixth. So the readathon is almost over. This is what I did last round was extend my reading past the week long reading date just because I feel like a week isn't enough time in which for me to like actually read much. And I prefer to just like have the whole month. I read Queer Lit like all year, but I would prefer to like have the whole month to kind of like focus on that. So I put a shitload of books on hold. And so I guess I just wanted to kind of talk about or talk through like what I've been reading. I'm gonna start off with The Tea Dragon Society, which is a really cute children's comic that I've been seeing like literally everywhere. It's really, really cute. <laughs> I will say that for it. I will say it's also very, very short. There's not a lot here. Although I think the whole concept of the tea dragons is really, really cute. It's just like, I liked it. I thought it was really cute. I don't think I really like loved it, loved it. Even though I plan am planning on continuing the series and getting the tea dragon festival, which I believe literally just came out like a week ago. It doesn't follow these same two characters. Um, it follows a different set of characters, but it's still continuing like the storyline or whatever. So We'll see how that goes. The next thing I picked up was a comic by the same author, Katie O'Neill, and it's Princess Princess Ever After, which I've been hearing a shitload about. Again, this one is also really short, but I feel like a lot more happens in here. And I just really loved this, like with all my heart. Like this is literally the pure queer fairy tale that like all of us have needed, like, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like all the bullshit that we went through, or at least I went through with like coming out and like embracing your identity and like having to figure that out with like no guideposts or like seeing any actual like same-sex relationships in media or around you or anything. <laughs> this is like what my childhood was missing, you know what I'm saying? Like this, this made the kid in me like really, really happy. Just because the princesses are adorable. Like I love that one is like, you know, taking on the traditional men's role and rescuing this other princess who like is being made fun of by her sister for like being fat and stupid, but she just like, basically they form a friendship and she kind of comes to realize that like, she's not stupid, like she's a great ruler and like her sister's just jealous of her. And then there's also a uh, male prince in this story. <laughs> it's really cute because he's like very bitter about the role that princes are expected to play in like always rescuing and always doing all this heroic stuff. And, uh, this chick's like, yo, you don't have to, you don't have to do that role. Like, if you don't want to do that, you don't have to do that. And then just like, he becomes an advisor to both of them and they just get married. And <laughs> this princess is able to like calm down an ogre. Cause like, they think he's like stomping a city down, but it turns out he's just dancing. Like literally this is just so adorable and pure. I think it might've knocked as the crow flies out of my top comic for this year. This is really, really highly adorable. I like highly recommend this if you're looking for just like the most adorable fluff ever. I absolutely adore this. I might need to buy it. And I never say that about like anything. But yeah, so after reading two of her works, I also put Aquacorn Cove on hold, which is another one of her, her works. I'll also say, I don't know what it was about this art style in here and I don't know which, uh, if Tea Dragon Society or Princess Princess came first, but I enjoyed the art style in here like a lot more than in Tea Dragon Society. And that may just be personal preference because they are really similar, but I feel like this one is much more flat. Like there's less dark lines, if that makes any sense. Like this one has a lot more dark lines, which I think makes it a lot crisper. And like, I enjoyed that a lot more, but it makes sense for like the tone of this story, like the soft tone for it to be more soft art. Kind of reminds me like if you cut out shapes of construction paper, if that makes any sense. Okay, moving right along to Orpheus Girl. I was kind of iffy about this one when I saw that it had come out. I couldn't really decide whether to put it on hold or not. And then I saw that it was the group book for the Queer Lit Readathon this round. It's essentially a retelling of the Orpheus myth with these two teens from Texas who are like basically closeted lesbians. They get found out and then sent to one of those uh, re-education camps that are supposed to like get rid of their gayness or like recondition them not to be gay. So I will say one thing I loved about this book and I kind of already showed this on my Instagram is that it has a content warning for 
like violence and stuff like that which I think more books should start doing to be honest but I'm glad it has that because this book is like very very dark. I started out liking this a lot more than um, I ended up liking it. <laughs> the writing in here I thought was very good at first but I noticed that the author uses like a lot of the same language and she does have seem to have like a very big focus on like describing hands like the hands are always like white knuckled or squeezing or like she repeats these kind of phrases over and over again like nails digging into skin and I'm just like after after a while I was just kind of like over it I also didn't really feel like I got like a physical image of the characters in my mind like there wasn't really much of a like a description to them I feel like and I don't know like I liked overall what was happening like the whole found family situation that was going on at the actual camp because a lot of the the other queer kids that were there um, were really cool. I especially loved Leon. Like, I thought he was a great character. I love that this dealt with the conflict specifically between Christianity and gay sexuality. I just felt <laughs> like I liked the story and I liked all the, the subject matter and what it was dealing with and the fact that um, this girl for her sexuality is like disowned by her very old-fashioned grandma. Like, I liked a lot of the subjects that were dealt with, but I felt like the story was very predictable. Like, the ending was very predictable. You saw it coming a mile away. And, and overall, just like the ending is very vague. Like, we don't really get to see what happens with their story, which I understand it's supposed to be a retelling. I haven't read a lot of retellings, nor do I know a lot of myth. So, like, that element of it was kind of cool. But, yeah, I don't know. I was just left feeling kind of unimpressed, I think, because of the writing. I was just kind of like, meh. On this one like I really wanted to like it because I think it deals with a lot of like very heavy subjects and that's another thing it was a very heavy book I didn't really feel emotional about it but I could like the subjects were heavy like I didn't feel weighed down or sad but I didn't think it had the emotional impact that maybe it should have had so this would probably be like I don't know two to three stars for me probably two because it was just okay um, three if I'm being generous and then completely switching tones I read James Baldwin's The Fire Next Time. This is a very short, 100-page uh, nonfiction book. It basically consists of, like, two essays. One is him writing to, I believe, his nephew. And I didn't even realize, okay, I read Tanahashi Coates' Between the World and Me a few months ago, and I didn't even realize that book was named for a phrase taken from this. Like, that's literally a direct quote from James Baldwin. Essentially, he took, like, Tanahashi Coates took that idea and wrote an entire book that was a much longer letter to his own nephew so it was like an interesting remix of James Baldwin's original idea which I did not know like I kind of wish I had known that going into it but I'm kind of like doing this backwards now like I'm getting to the James Baldwin now. What made me want to get into him is I watched the documentary I Am Not Your Negro which I had actually wanted to watch like years and years ago. I thought it was going to be live action I did not realize it was a documentary but listening and like seeing the clips of the way that he spoke and interacted and challenged white people that he was in discussions with like I absolutely loved like the way that he spoke and everything that he was saying and just like just like a very enigmatic man. He talks a lot about how he grew up and how he became disillusioned with Christianity and preaching because he was a preacher at one point. Also how he kind of disapproves of Malcolm X, not Malcolm specifically but the idea that instead of following or worshiping a white god that somehow this black god being the god of islam is going to save the black community instead he feels like we're just replacing one sort of deity for another he describes meeting elijah muhammad who is like basically the man that converted malcolm x to islam and how he kind of told him to his face that he didn't he wasn't going to join he didn't really agree with this idea and I really think that a lot of his ideas about like race relations and where we need to go as a country were right. <laughs> and he's like, if we don't, basically he says that if we don't get our shit together and address this problem now, like all hell's gonna break loose. And that's kind of what the, what the book is named for, like the fire next time. The earth is gonna burn, you know what I'm saying? Like, and I feel like that's, he's so prophetic because that's literally happening now with like defenseless black people being shot and Black Lives Matter and race relations just being very, very tense right now. So he didn't really agree with uh, Malcolm's idea that we need to have like a separate black nation, like black people separating from the white. I'll read just a little quote from it. In short, we, the black and the white, deeply need each other here if we are really to become a nation, if we are really, that is, to achieve our identity, our maturity as men and women. To create one nation has proved to be a hideously difficult task. 
there is certainly no, no need now to create two, one black and one white. So yeah, I think that about sums up his view on sort of the racial turmoil that was going on uh, when this was published. Okay, now to talk about the things I'm currently reading. I talked about this in my TBR for the last round of Queer Lit Readathon, but it's Surpassing the Love of Men by Lillian Faderman. It essentially dissects what lesbianism has looked like throughout time. So kind of like romantic friendships and mistaken ideas that a lot of men had about like what lesbianism is and what like lesbian sex looked like. And actually this is very, very well written for a nonfiction book. It's, it's very entertaining. There are a lot of like first-hand examples and first-hand quotes and it's not dry like a lot of other non-fiction that I picked up recently like um goddesses horrors wives and slaves this is very very dry and very historical and I've been kind of like falling asleep through it having to force myself through it this is not like this is actually a pleasure to read and another thing that I found out that kind of made me happy like this is quite a bulky book but the majority of it is notes and references so this is kind of where the book ends and all this right here is just notes so it's about 400 pages long and I'm like I think 80 pages in but anyways a lot of the misconceptions that men of like the 15th and 16th centuries had about like what lesbians did sexually is kind of hilarious like a lot of it is them thinking that like women just had big clits and that's why they had like such an aggressive sexuality or that they one woman was able to penetrate another like with her giant clit like <laughs> like literally just like the ignorance was astounding because there wasn't a lot of literature about sex being written by women at these times. So it's just really, really fascinating. And it's fascinating to see how some of the attitudes that prevail about lesbianism, um, like they're still there to this day. Like <laughs> just like a lot of ignorance and a lot of like fetishizing lesbian sex. And yeah, it's it's just crazy how not a whole lot has changed. So this is this is really, really good, really interesting. I would recommend picking it up for sure. The chapters are very short which is nice. So then the other thing I'm currently reading is I Might Regret This by Abby Jacobson, which if you don't know, Abby is one half of the Broad City duo. So if you guys have ever watched the, the TV show, then you'll know who she is. But um, this is kind of her memoir slash recounting of a cross country road trip that she took after she was like heartbroken, basically. And a lot of people don't know this, but she actually identifies as bi, I believe. And her breakup that she's documenting in this was from a woman who I think was actually the actor Carrie Brownstein, if I'm not mistaken. She doesn't mention her by name, but I'm pretty sure that's who she's talking about. I like read the first little chapter of this and then realized that this would sound a lot better read like in her voice. So then when I went on to Libby, I was like pleasantly surprised to find that the audiobook was available. And this is another one that I had been, I like wanted to read like a year ago when I saw that it had come out and then just... I don't know, it somehow slipped past me, but anyway, so I got the audiobook and yeah, let me tell you, that was a much better experience. Like, I love her voice. It's kind of like, kind of a little bit scruffy and like a little bit gravelly, but also like cute. I don't know how to describe it. Like, I just, I really like her voice and she's just freaking hilarious. Like listening to this and just like her thoughts literally make me like laugh out loud. Some of the like ridiculous stuff that she thinks, but it's also like very relatable. Like she's actually, she's really, really funny. What I've been doing since there's also drawings in this book is... I've been listening to like the chapter and then at the end of the chapter she'll have like her drawings or whatever and so after I get done listening to the audio I will go and like look at her drawings because the audiobook doesn't really make an attempt to describe the drawings that she put in here which is kind of irritating but like I get it so I'm kind of glad I have the physical copy even though I'm listening to the audio so I don't like miss out on anything and I'm sure it's not like a very vital vital part of the experience to know like what podcast she was specifically listening to when she drove from Texas to wherever but like I just do like the feeling of like getting the whole experience and like not missing anything. I believe Remembered Reads put out a video um, talking about this exact thing like missing things in audiobooks like does it bother you like the for example the drawings in this book. So yeah I'll link to that video if I can find it because that's a very good discussion. So yeah I'm, I'm in the midst of this I'm about two hours in it's a six hour long audiobook which is nice because I don't like super long audiobooks. I just finished a very moving chapter where she talks about how just from the simple act of her girlfriend telling her to tuck in her shirt made her kind of embrace her queerness within herself and I don't know it was just like very very powerful and very moving I was like unexpectedly like oh god you know because a lot of it's very very funny but this like really hit me for some reason so yeah this is a really powerful exploration of queerness that I think people don't even like register half the time that like she's queer 
So it, it's really nice to see like a more mature woman in their 30s talking about her relationship with a woman. Okay, now let's talk about the things I got but I haven't read. Okay, this fucker. I did not realize this book was so freaking big, guys. Whenever I see pictures of it on like Instagram and stuff, it's just the cover. You can't tell that it's a fat little clunker. But anyways, I don't know much about this other than space. Girls in love. Sad space girls in love. Yeah, that's that's really like all I need to know. But so this is a graphic novel. I think it might be YA. I'm not really sure. But um, it does have an endorsement quote from Brian K. Vaughn, who's the writer for the comic series Saga, which I adore that series so far. So that, that gives me like really, really high hopes for this, like that it'll be good. The other thing I have is Summer of Salt, which I saw in one of Christie's videos. Books are pretty neat. I will link to her. But yeah, I don't I think it's about like girls in love and witchery and like at a certain age, you're supposed to manifest powers and this like one girl is still waiting on her powers to manifest and something's gonna happen. I don't know. <laughs> it's really all I know about it. And then the last book that I got specifically for Queer Lit was An Absolutely Remarkable Thing by Hank Green. I didn't really have a shitload of interest in this when it came out, but then I saw Savvy's video where she talks about bisexual representation in books from like worst to best, I believe. And this was at the top of her list for like bisexual representation, I believe. Like apparently it has some like iconic bi rep. So obviously like, you know, bisexual representation still being one of the more lacking parts of the LGBTQ within fiction. Um, I'm there for it and also like I'm bi so of course I want to like see that representation like in action. So I'm pretty excited for this. I'm really curious how his writing differs from John Green's if it's going to be very different or very similar. Like I'm curious to like compare the two styles like a little nerds. I've also seen it classified as sci-fi which makes me like really curious because like from the cover you wouldn't think so right? But now that I'm looking closer maybe these are like robots or something. So that's dope. I love me some sci-fi. Yeah, so that's all the queer books I am reading, read, plan to read, etc. within the next few weeks. How did Queer Lit Readathon go for you guys? What queer books are you reading? How do you feel about these? Let me know in the comments. Thank you so much for caring and I'll see you guys next week with another video. Peace.